We welcome university students, faculty, administrators, and friends from the community and state. I'm Frank Caliendo, the academic director of the New Center and the department head of economics and finance at USU. It's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Etan Shashinsky, Professor Emeritus at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Professor Shashinsky received a PhD in economics from MIT and has held academic positions at Princeton, Harvard, Stanford, Columbia, Berkeley, MIT, and Brown. Professor Shashinsky is a world-renowned financial economist specializing in insurance markets, social security, and natural resources. He has held editorial positions at leading academic journals and has advised a number of organizations and nations such as Malaysia, Bolivia, and Romania on matters of public finance. The combination of scientific rigor and policy relevance in his work is emblematic of the type of discussion the center seeks to cultivate. Today, he will talk about restoring fiscal solvency to the federal budget, and in particular, how to build a resilient social security system. His lecture will go for about 50 minutes, followed by 10 minutes of questions from the audience. We ask that you hold your questions until that point. Professor Shashinsky. Thank you, Frank. Thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, back again, I have been here a number of years back, and uh, you, the weather couldn't be better. The scenery is wonderful. Thank you all. I will be talking today about pension design. Um, before I go to the slides, um, let me start with some background on, on the issue. Um, you know, the first, to date, almost all countries in the world, developed and developing countries alike, have governmental pension systems, public pension systems, as well side by side with private pension funds. Um, it's fair to ask, first of all, uh, why should the governments be involved in this market in the first place? Because, uh, well, as economists, certainly we believe in the invisible hand and, and individuals will make their choices. The markets will create the right incentives to provide a smoothing of consumption of a lifetime and so forth. This, will, this, will be, this could be arranged by the market. So what are the reasons for in, involvement of the government, which, as I said, stretches across all countries today? It's impossible to talk about it without referring to behavioral economics. You saw that yesterday the Nobel in economics was also given for this field, which basically means that people behave in a boundedly rational way, not perfectly rational, as an economist once from Cambridge, England, uh, Pigou said, with telescopic faculties. A young person like you, the age of 20 or so, less even, doesn't look to the age of 65 with like a telescope and decides how to save, how much to save to have enough there for after uh, retirement. Short-sightedness is something which has been observed uh, in their, and, and uh, inadequate savings as a result by individuals for retirement has been observed. For example, I'll cite before I go into the slides, I'll cite a, a survey by the social security system in this country uh, some years ago has shown that um, Americans, uh, on average, have a ratio of about two to one of the wealth that you accumulated, say, by the age of 65, to their income. And this would allow, what, what is the adequate wealth if people were left to their own decisions, how much to save? It depends on the interest rate, the discounting, and so forth. But on the, on, on the whole, people would, would need about six to one five to one ratio of wealth to income upon retirement, on the verge of retirement, to live off, say, a consumption which is, say, 80% of what you had during your working life. If you needed a little less, maybe five to one wealth 
But as I said, the average in this country is two to one. This is just the back of the envelope kind of calculation that shows people are not saving adequately for retirement and therefore we need something mandatory. And Social Security is mandatory. It's a payroll tax, 12.5% to Social Security, and in all countries it's mandatory. There is a tier, a voluntary tier, we'll come to that later on, on top of it, a voluntary savings on top of it, okay, 401k and others voluntary on top. But basically you need some mandatory system that will compel, let's say, paternalistically, individuals to save adequately for uh, retirement. You know, the first uh, pension system uh, was designed by Bismarck, the German chancellor, uh, in the 1890s of the 19th century. At that time, it was to stem the tide of socialism, uh, which came up. He gave rather a a modest uh, uh, retirement plan, Life expectancy at that time was about 65, and I think he started paying to people you know, people from 70 years on. So not many enjoyed that pension fund, but it 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 was an idea that you have to do something to uh, to alleviate the hardships uh, of old age, and then all other countries followed. In the UK, for example, beverage, uh, uh, Second World War, 1944, other countries. In this country. The social security system was inaugurated by FDR, of course, in 1935, after a prolonged battle with the Supreme Court because the constitutionality of the social security system was questioned. Uh, And he prevailed only after FDR uh, threatened to appoint five more judges to the Supreme Court and uh, and change the uh, uh, composition of the court at that time. But basically, the system as was designed uh, in all countries is based on what economists call a pay-as-you-go. I want to go into some of the concepts of pensions. It's not, pensions are divided into two types. One is pay-as-you-go, which means, in a minute I'll explain, or funded. Pay-as-you-go means basically that the young pay for the old. So it's a transfer. Americans pay 12.5% into Social Security. The Social Security pays out to retirees according to what the law specifies they are entitled to. And the the law is very specific, and we'll talk about it. That's pay-as-you-go. There's no investment. Social Security is doing no investment with, I'll say it with some exception, in the following sense. When you have a system of pay-as-you-go, in other words, the law specifies, you look at the book, the Social Security law. These are two huge compendiums. One part talks about the, what is the mandatory payments into the system, and the other part talks about the entitlements, okay, what people are entitled to. Nothing in the system guarantees that the expenditures of the social security system and the revenues will be uh, commensurate, will be, will be balanced, in balance, nothing. It couldn't be an automatic pilot that will left to its own just flying. You set the parameters, the parameters were set, were set according to the expectation of the birth rate, the demographics, life expectancy, and so forth. But they are changing. And in in certain ways, for example, the increase in life expectancy, I'll talk about that a lot uh, today, and the decrease in the birth rate. So the decrease in the birth rate, for example, means that picturesquely, the the older people are standing on fewer shoulders of the young who are working. And that changed, that you have to change the parameters if you want to make the system balanced, still balanced. So these are, the pay-as-you-go system has certain risks and they are mainly political risks that you have to change the parameters. This is always in the political arena. Uh, it's a pay-as-you-go, a social security doesn't invest, but let me say, I, I said uh, with, some ex- with an exception, nothing balances the revenues and the expenditures, but In this country, let's take an example, in other countries as well, we have the trust fund. What is the trust fund that you have in this country? It's the excess of the revenues that the Social Security has received over their expenditures up to now, the cumulative excess of the revenues over the expenditures since after Second World War, okay? When the baby boom occurred, lots of people then went into the labor force. Now they're going to retire. The trust fund now is $5 trillion is about sufficient to finance the Social Security for five years, but that's it. And the trust fund is going to go down slowly and the year 2035, it will disappear. The trust fund is specified to be invested only in treasuries 
And that's another issue, which I'm, I'm jumping here to some other policy issues, which we may raise later in the question and answers, that they have to invest it in treasuries only, not in the stock market. The idea was not to have any risks in the social security system. So they all are invested in treasuries, and but they are, it's going down. What will happen afterwards? After 1935, the prediction is, the forecasts are that Social Security will be able to pay at most three quarters of the entitlements. Something will have to be done. It's a legal, it's a legal obligation of Social Security to pay people what is specified in the law. So it's better to do it early on. That's why people have been talking during the last and the previous election campaigns here about, about changing, making reforms ahead of time. And all the time, reforms are planned. For example, the last committee that was uh, uh, effectively uh, was successful was so-called the Greenspan Committee, headed by Alan Greenspan, who later became the chair of the Fed, in 1981. And they decided the retirement age in which benefits from Social Security are will start being paid, uh, which was uh, 62, uh, 60, and then 65, will now rise from 65 to 67. A month a year, that's a wise policy, by the way, to do it slowly. You don't want people to face three years before they retire that the laws are changing, the rules have been changing. You're not going to get what you thought you will be getting in three years' time. So you want to do it, people could plan ahead, understand, knowing ahead of time that the things are changing, but in a predictable way. So they decided now we are, and the normal retirement age now in the U.S. is 67 years. And in all countries, it has been moving up. Why? Because life expectancy had been rising. In a way, you know, uh, uh, the increase in life, the, what is called the, 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 the crisis, the aging crisis, is, is, it's, paradox. it's a paradox. It's a blessing, right? People live longer. But the blanket is not, lo- not, is not enough to cover, to cover the body. When it grows, it grows. You need, you need a, a, a larger blanket. So... If you have to cover the car, either you increase the deductions, the contributions to Social Security, say from 12.5% to people have said just 1%, would make the system solvable for 50 years. Or reduce benefit or end a combination of those. Or end, change the retirement age. Increase the retirement age. Postpone the, the payment of benefits. Again, it's a question which has to be considered. It's a policy issue. And it has been moving up. And should it be... In this country, it's the same, it's unisex, it's the same, females and males, although women live four more years on average than men. Uh, The difference is shrinking a little bit, but the average is still four years, about four years, okay? Which means, basically, you should realize that men are subsidizing the women, right? Because equal, other things equal, ceteris paribus, uh, uh, women will receive benefits four more years than men. I'm not going to the normative question, is that justified or not? That's a fact. That's, that's, that's a fact. Um, um, and, it, and, and, and there are all kind of guesses why, whether, whether this gap will, is going to decrease because of the increased participation of females in the labor force. And you can see there are all kind of signs that females are also uh, the same illnesses that you get in labor force, pressure, and so forth. And so the, the gap is closing, but slowly. Where is it going is, is, is up uh, to guess. Um, that was, that was the system as put forward by FDR at the time. Now, a pay-as-you-go system, you should realize, is, 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 as I said, is something which the governments like that because you can start paying right away. See, in 1939, the system became, came into action. It was legislated in 35. In 1939, the first recipients of Social Security started getting benefits. These are people who almost haven't paid anything into the system. And they started getting benefits all their remaining life when they were retirees. Okay, 65 years or older. They almost haven't paid. It was a tremendous windfall to them. Uh, For the older generations earlier on, in the 40s, they had the tremendous windfall. But this creates the problem now because the ideas which will come to, to privatize Social Security, to move into a funded system, would cost now, would create the opposite. If, for example... Suppose, and there were proposals like that, take Social Security and provide it in a a funded way. People will now put in money and will get only the fruits of that money. It will be invested in the market. They'll have to wait. 
The difference is the cost of that move is now nine trillion dollars. That's exactly the gains in present value that the early generations in the 40s received that kept the, the, the windfalls that they had, and they haven't paid anything for it. It's exactly mathematically the same. So it's a very difficult problem. And in fact, originally when, when it was a, the idea of privatizing social security uh, uh, has come out because people calculated, Bob Barrow, Marty Feldstein at Harvard, others, looked at the internal rate of return. How much does, does on a lifetime basis, on the present value, if you know the, you, you discount the future, you have to, uh, so when you have a stream over time, you have to put it on, on, a, on, a, ba on a certain basis and it's called discounting it, right? Certain rate of, if you discount the future benefits and future contributions that the person has made, the return on that, the internal rate of return, the social security is about one and a half percent return. That's not a very good one. And people said, if we would have invested in the market, this would have been much better. And, and then started this whole movement of privatizing, so going to a funded system. President Reagan, under his, in his first campaign, actually was campaigning for that. And then they saw the figures, how much it would cost the transition. So you just imagine, you, you can see that there is a problem there because if you take away from the 12.5%, suppose there was 5%, there was a proposal at the time, I remember by Senator Simpson uh, and others, uh, Wyoming, uh, uh, to move 5% into personal accounts, like you have with the IRA, okay, into personal accounts. But the Social Security will have a hold then of those 5%, and they still have to pay to the retirees. So the current generation will have to pay more to cover up. So the, whole, the benefits will weigh out. The future gains by investing in the stock market and receiving more a return on average expected with risks, with risk, will outweigh the increased uh, 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 the increased taxes. So the committee, the, the commission that, uh, that then President Bush Sr. Uh, appointed at the time, the Boskin Commission, so uh, which was tilted towards privatizing, towards moving to a funded system, even that committee, which was very one-sided, has decided eventually to postpone it. They said, let's, the public should debate this for another year or two, and then we'll come back to this issue. So the system in this country, the social security, is a pay-as-you-go system. In other words, it is not investing. It's transfers from the working population to the retirees. There is another system possible, and I already mentioned it, which is funding, like pension funds. You put in the money, it's invested in the market, and whatever comes out, comes out. That's what you'll get. Cumulative, you accumulate a certain amount at re uh, upon retirement, and then it's converted into what economists call an annuity which is a simple calculation. How much would that bundle of money that you accumulated, the wealth that you accumulated to retirement, suffice to live for another 15 or 20 years in retirement, according to mortality tables and so forth? And this can be, this can be determined, ascertained, and, and, uh, and that's, the way, that's the way it is done in, in, uh, in pension funds, in pension funds. Of course, the increase in life expectancy requires either for the same kind of contributions to the pension fund, a decrease in benefit or an increase in contributions. Something will have to go because this, these are, these must be, pension funds have to be balanced. These are private pension funds. They will not, they can, they will not go bankrupt. Otherwise they'll go bankrupt. So the funding, funding idea is there in the 401k in this country. In other countries, it's, it's different, but that, these are basically the two concepts which I wanted to start with. Pay as you go, the social security is based on the pay as you go, and private pensions like the 401k are based on funding. Let me nevertheless say something about the 401k. 401k, which is employers, employers, uh, uh, run by employers, created, have a, also a problem. And this came out vividly, unfortunately, during the downturn in 2008. The, down, the, the, the recession of 2008, people who invested in the 401k in, lost about a third of their accumulation at that time. Think about somebody who is 63 years old and lost a third of what he or she have accumulated. There are only two choices. Either you continue working or you make up with a lower pension. And people have chosen both. People continued working. There's evidence that people decided then to just continue working. Necessity, out of necessity. Or uh, uh, make up with, with lower pensions. 
It shows, by the way, another thing, which the lesson that economists have learned from this is that as people approach retirement, if you are, I'm talking now funded funds, like, uh, uh, funded pension funds, like the 401k, the risk should be, should be decreasing as you approach retirement. It's not in the interest of somebody who is 63 years old to still invest in the stock market, getting a higher return because of the risks of the stock market. Somebody who is 25 years old can invest in stocks because they'll have many years, about 30 years, to average out losses and gains, right? The law of large numbers could, could work out. But somebody is, so basically, for example, countries like Chile now have adopted, it's called the Chilean model, that the portfolio of people is depending on age and decreasing the risks. The young have more stocks and fewer bonds. And as you age, the fraction of bonds is increasing relative to stocks. And that makes a lot of sense, this model, that the risks should decrease according to age, but they never disappear. And the question, should Social Security also adopt, for example, in the trust fund, which is now $5 trillion, should the Social Security invest in the stock market rather than in treasuries, which give now a trifle of very low return, of course, given the interest rates in the market now in the, and in the foreseeable future now, they will not come back to what it has been. So something will have to give and they have to, they have to decide whether to invest perhaps part of the trust fund in the stock market. Economists have been debating this question and, and what is the appropriate risk that the social security should undertake in investing in the market. Uh, the market has been doing very well now, but we know the volatility of the stock market, uh, the past volatility, uh, means that the Social Security is undertaking certain risks and so forth. This is still debated, but that's a possibility of a reform in this country. Finally, I want to say something before I go to the, to the presentation here. This is all about the background in, in, in the US, because this will also focus on other countries as well on the structure in other countries, uh, is the, the issue of progressivity. Social security has basically two major goals. One is to smooth consumption of a lifetime. You know, people work the first five phase of their life, okay? Up to 65, we can determine the age and, and we'll talk about it in a minute. And then there's retirement, okay? They would like to accumulate enough to save for retirement, to enjoy. the. The consumption during retirement relative to the consumption that they had during work is called the replacement rate. What should be the appropriate replacement rate? We can argue 80%, 70%, 60%. In other words, should a retiree have an income? What does a retiree require? An income of 60%, 70%, 80% of what he or she had before retirement, okay? We can argue about that. But clearly not much less than that. In order to smooth consumption, we need savings, long-term saving and pensions, and pensions. And they should be mandatory because people are not saving adequately voluntarily, okay? Uh, so the progressivity of the system, I, I said I'll talk, if you look at the schedules of Social Security, you'll see there are brackets. The people at the lower end are getting a higher fraction of what they put in. There's a formula, by the way. The formula is, it's a complicated formula. It's a formula, basically, it is, you put in your money, 12.5%, and then upon retirement, Social Security calculates the 10 best years during your working phase, your working life. And out of that, they, they take the average, the average out, and this, there's a formula based on that average, okay? The 10 best years up to the last 35 years, okay? That, that, it's a formula, and the formula is progressive. If you look at the curve, it is progressive. The lower, the people with lower income are getting a higher fraction back as social security benefits. And those at the upper end, there's also a ceiling. The upper, there's also a ceiling in contributions, by the way, which has been a political issue in this country. You may recall Obama campaigned that he will take off the ceiling, uh, which is, I think, around 135,000 a year, 135,000 a year. And this is regressive, okay, because people who have a quarter of a million dollars are paying exactly as the people who have $130,000 to Social Security. But the benefits are also capped. So there's some logic to this, okay? Uh, uh, but these, the, the progressivity, the, what I call the scheduler progressivity, if you look at the, at, the, at the law and you'll see the brackets, 
it looks progressive, but I want to mention at least two, and there are more factors working against it on a lifetime basis, which is the true correct concept to look at, lifetime pro uh, uh, income. Lifetime progressivity, I mean, uh, how much do people get on a lifetime basis, the benefits relative to the contributions over your lifetime, the benefits, the present value of benefits relative to the present value of contributions. And there are two factors that work against the schedular progressivity. One is that the people at the lower end of the schedule are entering the labor force earlier in life than the others. Others are going to college, like you guys, and so forth. And some people start working early on, and so forth. So they're paying more years into Social Security, okay? At the same time, their life expectancy is lower than those at the higher income levels. So they are getting benefits a smaller number of years than the others. This all works against the progressivity, which means that on a lifetime basis, the system is much less progressive, if at all, than you look at the schedule, right? There are also differences, I, I said already, about by, by gender and other elements. And uh, I was talking to Frank Caliendo uh, about, about the, 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 also the fact, the observation that nowadays the gap in life expectancy between by income level is widening. The reason is that the, there is a steady increase in life expectancy. That's, that's the feature of the 20th century. It's, never, it's, not, it, it's not smooth. At the beginning of the 20th century, it was infant mortality which went down. In the middle, in the 50s of uh, uh, 1950s, it was the cardiac revolution. Better machines, better, better medicines, and so forth, or cardiac. So people in the 50s and 60s stayed alive. Survival rates increased. In recent decades, the increase is mainly at old and very old people, 90 years, 95 year olds, by the way, 1% live more than 100, okay? If you look at the uh, mortality tables. So it's old and very old, and the reason is what I call the medicalization of death. Basically, life extension is now by medical means. And medical means are also correlated with income. Those who can afford it are not. And that increased the, this increases the gap by income level between those who can afford it and, and, and less, which means, again, this is something to think about, is that the designers of Social Security in this country have not coped with this question, but it's something which will have to be addressed uh, not too far in the future. Um, so as I said, lifetime con uh, progressivity is the right concept. And therefore, don't be mistaken by looking at, these at, the, at, the, at the concavity of, this, of, the, of the function of the benefits, the brackets, the various brackets. This is, this is the scheduler progressivity. But the right concept is on a lifetime basis, what people get all over the lifetime of benefits and contributions. And that is much less progressive, if at all, as I said. Uh, yeah, I said I will say something about early eligibility. And again, it ties a little bit to behavioral. You know, the earliest eligibility age to receive Social Security benefits in this country is 62. It's interesting, by the way, that, so, that this early eligibility age of 62 has not been changed by the Greenspan Commission. The Greenspan Commission in 1981 changed the normal retirement age, as I said, from 65 to 67, a month a year. And we are now at 67. Okay? But they haven't changed the early eligibility. People cannot collect before they are 62 years old, okay, and later. For some reason, which is worth considering, you should think about it. Why didn't they change older 62? If life expectancy is rising, they should also change, increase the, the early eligibility age, and they haven't. In fact, you can ask, why do we have an early eligibility age at all? Why don't let people retire and start getting less in, in value, but uh, social security benefits at the age of 50? I want to retire, I'm willing to take less and to retire earlier. There are two considerations which have to balance. One is people may retire too early for their own good, that's behavioral economics, and regret it later, and there are studies that show that. People who retired earlier were willing to receive smaller social security benefits and then at later ages said, why did I do that? This was a real mistake, I shouldn't have done it. But then, against that, you have people who have good reason to retire earlier, family, medical reasons, family reasons, other reasons. And so 62 was considered to be a balance between these two considerations. 
the cutoff, uh, the early eligibility. But the much more difficult question is why does, how should 62, this age, rise as life expectancy is rising? How is this balance moving dynamically over time? What is moving faster? Those who would retire earlier and so forth, it's, I'm just telling you questions which people who are in research in economics are willing, should consider and are considering these days. Um, this was as much as I wanted as a background, and now I'll turn to the, to the presentation here, which is, you should understand, what I'm going to present here is not a model that fits all countries. It's pension design, what I think is a reasonable design for pensions. I said already that the question is not why governments should be involved. Governments are involved because of behavioral issues. Individuals are not saving uh, out of their own, uh, voluntarily, adequately for retirement. And governments are involved, should be involved. The only question is how. Could be a pay-as-you-go, could be funded, 401k, any mixture. And so the question is the design, pension design. How should governments best be involved in order to not to impose unnecessary distortions? Anytime the government is involved, some distortions are involved. Okay? You minimize those distortions as much as possible. So the model that I'm going to present here and telling you a little bit about the experience in the European countries, Sweden, other countries, uh, is something to be learning from, uh, I believe, and, and, and from other countries, the Netherlands, Germany, other countries, and I want to tell you about it, which is somewhat different than in this country. You'll see, we don't have, in the US, we don't have the first tier, but why don't I uh, move to the uh, presentation? So, okay, I already said the first tier is a uniform level of, of pensions, a uniform level of pension, flat. We don't have it here. But in the UK, for example, the first level in the Netherlands, in the UK, the first tier, the first layer is a flat one. In other words, everybody receives the same level of benefits from, from, pen, from public pensions, independent of, independent of income during lifetime. This is supposed to be the safety net against poverty. So it should be at a relatively low level, but adequate for survival, for reasonable uh, 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 maintenance during, during retirement. And it's flat. We can argue about that. Uh, uh, and also how to synchronize that, the first tier, with the second, which I'm coming to. The first tier is non-contributory. In other words, you don't pay tax in, in these countries. Not in, we don't have that here. It's non-contributory in the sense it's financed by a supplement to the income tax, say the beverage, Lord Beverage in the UK, called after him, with adjustments to increase life expectancy. The structure is the same in the Netherlands, New Zealand, and other countries. The second tier, I'm coming to the second tier, and that's perhaps the perhaps the more innovative and new idea that I'll I'm trying to bring today. Uh, to you, because it has been tested now in a number of countries, and it's interesting. Particularly nowadays, I'll say a word now, nowadays with the low interest rates that will probably persist uh, uh, for quite a while, the issues, the problems of pension funds who are based on funding, on investing in the market, not only the riskiness, but the level of the returns in the market are is much lower than in the past. And therefore, the pension funds have a tendency to go into more risky investments. And that's very problematic because the interest of the retirees is to reduce risk, diversify as much as possible, go into index funds, diversify the risks, and don't go into more risky. But the pension funds want to, in order to maintain the parameters that they have promised to their uh, clients, they have to go to get returns which are adequate. Otherwise, they'll have to change the contracts. And that's it. The new, for newcomers at least, okay? So the second tier is based on a partially funded notional defined contribution, which I'll explain in a minute what it is about. That's an idea that has been first put forward by one of my teachers in MIT, Franco Modigliani, by the way, the niece of the painter Modigliani, 
uh, uh, Pinto Modigliani was his uncle, I'm sorry, was his uncle, uh, and Franco Modigliani put it forward, and that's the reason why, probably why Italy has adopted it among the first countries, this notion. What is notional? You'll see notional is like virtual, virtual defined contribution idea. The objective of the second tier is to spread the risks between workers and retirees and the cross-generation. It is a synthesis between defined benefits, which was the pay-as-you-go, social security, is defined benefits. You have a formula, what you'll get is defined benefits, or the defined contribution, which is investing in the market, and the market will, bear, will be good years. When you work, then you'll have a, lot, a, high, a high pension. The bad years, you'll have bad. The idea was, of course, the averaging will, is, is going to provide a reasonable return in the market. Uh, and the system is very similar to what happens in Germany and Sweden. The main objective is consumption smoothing and risk. I'll, I'll elaborate on that later on. The third tier is voluntary savings, the 401ks. Let me just say one word about the 401k because I don't want to return to that. The 401ks in this country, in addition to the issue of framing, again, coming back to behavioral, you know, there were various studies. When a worker comes, and a new employee comes to a firm, he has to fill out a, a form, which is, would you like to participate in a 401k of our firm? And so forth, and he writes down. Other firms, the presumption is, the default is, that you are participating. If you don't want, you have to sign, I do not want to be in the 401k. This framing, what economists call the framing difference, makes a huge difference in participation rates. Just the wording. You see the difference? I'm saying, the, what, some firms are saying, would you like to participate in the 401k? GE so gives to each new employee a form that says, would you like to participate in the 401k? And you answer yes or no, okay? The, up, the, the other one will be something which was put forward by Enron, for example. This is, the presumption is that you will participate, and if you don't, you're right, I do not want to participate in 401k. You just fill out a V on that, on that question. The differences in the participation rates is enormous, which is a problem, right? It's not rational. How come the wording changed the outcome? But that's a fact. So it's, again, we are back to behavioral economics. But the point, the problem I want to point out and with the 401k is a different one. There hasn't been a ceiling on the 401k assets. It's, it's all defined contributions. They invest in the market. 401k, for example, of GE, Ford Motors, GM, and so forth, they invest in the market. But employees are typically convinced to invest in the firm in which they are employed. And this is a very bad policy because the interest of the employees is to diversify risks. And if you convince them to invest most of what they invested in, what they put in the 401k in the firm in which you are employed, you concentrate your risk, you exacerbate the riskiness. The worst case, of course, the example that everybody has in mind was Enron. Enron went under, 40,000 people, 40,000 workers lost their pension funds because they invested almost all their pensions in the in Enron stocks. A disaster, a real disaster. There's no other word. A disaster. Because they were convinced that Enron is a wonderful company. And if you invest, you show your loyalty to the company. So here is something, again, that, that, that was called for. Put a ceiling by le legislating. Congress should legislate a ceiling, a very low ceiling, the maximum that an, a participant in 401k can invest in the firm, in the stocks, in the shares of the firm in which he or she are employed. 5%. Example, okay? Congress, and this is clearly something where there could be unanimity in Congress. Nonpartisanship. They couldn't agree on even that simple case. That's just to, again, an, a sad example of the... Uh, of the situation in DC. Um, the adjustments I'll talk about. There's a balance mechanism in corporate second tier. I'll explain. The first tier, the flat one, as I said, is for poverty reduction. It's a subsistence rate. It's in all countries. Everybody gets the same amount. Say, okay, you'll see what about $500, $600 in the Netherlands, in Sweden, and, and so forth. It's for subsistence. 
Okay? Clearly inadequate. You need something on top. But that's the safety net. Okay? And it's independent of income, so the coverage is wide. It's also fair to people who do not participate. For example, women who in the past have not participated in the labor force, everybody is receiving it, independent of whether you were in the labor force or not. And so it's one that is really aimed at reducing the poverty rate. Okay? Uh, demography and others require changes in labor participation, behavioral economics, we already talked about some, procrastination, framing effect, I already mentioned quite a bit. Let's start moving. I think we'll have to move faster. Uh, yeah, this is, this is just to show you, see in Sweden, there were, there were about 700, 700 pension funds, and there was a default. A default fund. The government has made, put up a default fund. The, the percent, and I'll just give this up. Uh, anyway. The percent of people who decided to use the default, look here, in 2009, 98% choose, chose the default. It's basically people chose not to choose. They said the government has a default fund. They probably think this is the best for us. It creates a tremendous uh, burden on those who formulate the default. It's true, by the way, about other things. I mentioned to some people here the study by in, in how the default, the, the people, the default is, is choice is, is so critical. For example, there was a study in New Jersey and Pennsylvania about car insurance. And in the two, in the two states, in New Jersey, car, the compulsory car insurance is cheap but you can add on uh, for unemployment, for medical care and others, and then it will cost more. In Pennsylvania, it's just the opposite. It's expensive with all these things, medical care, unemployment, and so forth. You can waive that just by making a V. I don't want that, okay? So two orthogonally different plans, 80% of the people in those two states chose the default. Completely the opposite. It, basically, it shows, it proves what I said before. People decide not to choose. It's complicated, so I'll take the default. Probably somebody thought better than I do, what is good for me, and that's it. In two adjacent states, and so forth. So Sweden is another example, 98% choosing the default fund. The first tier, I'll have to run faster now. The first, the first tier in, your, in Europe, there are problems which are, I think I'll just give this up, this sort of hangs from my ear. Um, in, in Europe, they, uh, uh, they have problems with the, the, the migrants, the immigrants, okay? The first one is based, the first tier is based just on residence. Typically, you'll see 20 years of residence give you full first coverage on the first tier. Let's say $700, $800, everybody's getting it. If you lived in that country, in the country for 20 years or more. Those who came later on as new immigrants will get prorated. Okay, will be prorated. That's a major problem in, in Europe, of course, with all the migration, the migrants, the new migrants. The issue of the term of residence to get full payments in the first tier is a major political issue. Um, another, yeah, what I mentioned here is the remaining spouse. In this country too, this, the, in Social Security, when people get and in, in pensions in, in the 401k, a spouse, a deceased, a, dece a, a person, a deceased person, the spouse is receiving typically 50% of that, of what the couple has received while both were alive. And that's considered inadequate because there are in a family living, there are returns to scale, what economists call returns to scale. I think a single person in a couple who remains alive needs more than 50% to maintain the standard of living that the couple may had before, like 75% people think. This can be arranged by reducing the, the, the pensions that the couples are receiving and the singles should be getting 75%. I just mentioned that because I think that's another thing which has to be paid attention to. An affluence test is also interesting. In the Netherlands, for example, see Social Security, everybody gets, gets, gets the, the, whatever it is, $1,000, let's say, flat, independent of what you earn. Bill Gates is getting it, and so forth. Everybody is getting it. Mr. Huntsman is getting it, everybody. 
uh, but in Holland, they decided to tap off the upper 5%. The upper 5% of income are chopped off from the first tier. It's one way. They didn't want to make it income dependent, but they chopped off the upper, the top, an affluence test, okay? An affluence test. I talked about early eligibility a little bit. I cannot go on. C countries which have citizens' uh, pensions, the first tier that I mentioned are Australia. I won't go into it, uh, all these countries. Canada, you see all these countries, full benefits 40 years after age 50, which means 55, okay? And so forth, could be 55, other countries 65, typically it would be 65, okay? And otherwise it's prorated. And you see the levels, $500 per month and so forth. Another question is, will the first tier be taxed? In other words, suppose somebody has a, has, has, has a, has a uh, gasoline station, okay, on top of, he's retired, but he has a gasoline station, you have an income on top of it. Should income tax be, the, should, should the social security benefits be added to the other income that you have, okay, because you have, you have other income, compared to people who have nothing else and rely totally on social security. So there are countries who tax social security, who add social security to, to, to other components, income components, and there are countries who uh, do not. Uh, I want, that's, all these are questions to be considered. Chile, the Netherlands, New Zealand. I don't think I will have to. I'll, I'll, I'll jump over that. All these are non-contributory. Sweden, 40 years after the age of 25, which again means 65, and they receive about $640 a month. And so that's the first tier. Okay, flat to avoid poverty. Okay, non-contributory. And again, by the way, the fact, this was also a debate in this country, by the way, you're, you're too young to remember, but when Al Gore was running, there was the lockbox issue. Should the social security, the trust fund, be there completely locked only for social security because otherwise the government has always a tendency to snatch it away for other purposes. And you would like to secure the benefit that social security status. So the, the idea was the trust fund should be a lockbox only for social security. This is always a question that the legislature should not change the terms. And should the, should the social security be based on contributory or non-contributory? The second tier is really the one that I, maybe completely new to you and even to some of the faculty here who are here because this is a relatively new idea from the late 90s uh, in Europe and so forth. What is the idea? And it becomes more relevant. And uh, first of all, it was implemented. It's not, it's not out of my head that I'm telling you about it. Sweden, Latvia, Germany, Poland, other countries I'll come, I'll come to it have adopted it since the 1990s, last century. Um, non Notional defined contribution. Notional means virtual. It is, the fo you'll understand what it is. Everybody has to contribute X percent of income to a personal account in the government. The government doesn't invest the account. It's so again, it sounds like a return, but you'll see. The government determines how much you will get a return. The government, not the market. The government determines a return on your investment. In Sweden, for example, 5%. It was 5%. So you put in 100 last year, at the end of the year, your account is 105. The 105 is accumulating at 5%, you'll have 225, and so forth and so on. Okay? The government determines a return. It's very important today when they struggle with the low interest rates that the government determines that, and rather than the market. Okay? So it's notional. It's a virtual thing. It, it sounds as if you in, the government is investing. You get 5%, but it's only as if. It's virtual. You have an account, it's only for accounting purposes, okay? You have an account in, with the government, Mr. X has an account, and the account provides a return that determined by the government of 5%, okay? And it's a notional interest rate determined by the government. Now, what is typically the notional interest rate varies? Some countries have adopted, Sweden took the notional interest rate to be the rate of growth of the real wage. Okay, okay, whatever it is, three and a half percent, four percent, whatever it is. Other countries such as Poland took not the wage, but the wage bill, W times L, both the labor force. So it will also take into account fluctuations in participation rate, in unemployment and so forth. And Italy took, I think, the rate of growth of GDP. Okay, which is 
with the laser beam. My eyes are not good, or the laser beam is not good. Anyway, the, uh, Italy, okay. Uh, um, and the cumulative amount then, the notional, the, the, the Swedish system, the notional, uh, the notional country, uh, uh, account, is then converted at, uh, upon retirement. Again, calculate the present value of the notional interest rate, at the notional interest rate, to a, an annuity, to a, to a benefit, retirement benefit. All this in the government through the government. It has, the, the basic idea with the notional defined contribution uh, system is to immunize households from the vicissitudes, from the, from the uncertainties of the market, the market risks. If the government decides, the government stands behind that rate of interest, the, rate, the notional rate of interest, and the households can be assured. With defined contribution plans, households carry the risks of the market. There will be good years or bad years, depending on the market. You will see it when you retire, whether there were, if there were bad years, you had it, okay? So the balance is just accounting. So Sweden enacted it, then, then Germany, I, I, I don't think we have time. I have 10 minutes, we have 10 minutes for questions and answers, so I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up. Is that uh, indexing, by the way, is another very good issue. Sorry, I run Russian topics. This is, there's so many topics. In the U.S., for example, the, the, the Social Security is indexed to the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. It's, again, a question. You think, of, well, that's fine. That's good. Keeping the real purchasing power. But other people would argue that maybe the uh, Social Security benefits should be indexed to the, uh, to the, to the wage growth. Because if it's indexed to the CPI and wages grow faster, it means the retirees are getting less than what the workers are getting, and they, it discriminates against the retirees versus the workers. Okay? It's an ideological issue. If you index it to the, real, to the growth rate of wages, index the, the, the benefits, Social Security, to wages rather than to CPI, it's more generous. But it has implications for the financing. Some countries have taken an average. For example, Finland has 20% to their wage growth, 80% to the CPI. Okay, so you can take Switzerland has 50-50. So but they have seen that this makes a difference. It's an ideological difference. If you want to keep the, stand, the relative standard of living of retirees relative to workers intact, you index it to wages. If you, are, if you, are willing, if you just want to maintain the standard of living of retirees, you index it to the CPI. Because it means they're purchasing power remains invariant, okay? Think of Poland did it, Latvia did it. This is Germany. I don't think we have the time to go into the German formula. It's very interesting, the German formula. It's very similar to the notional defined contribution, but okay. Uh, you can read about it if you, if you wish, if you're interested in that. Um, they also, Germany has also an interesting fact, I'll just mention and I'll finish it with that. No, with two more remarks. One is Germany also, the last factor here, PVT. Again, I don't think the, is there a beam here? Oh, the point, the point is very weak. You see it's an old speaker, so it doesn't, it doesn't react. Um, um, uh, the PV, the last one is simply, is a macro. Concept, which again to be think to be thought about in this country. Let me tell you what the issue is about. When you have recessions and and then and then and then uh, uh, acceleration in the GNP and so forth, Social Security is independent of the macro fluctuations. The work the, the retirees are in, have entitlements. They are receiving it whether the economy 2008 a recession they receive the same. You can ask a question. When you have a recession, everybody has to tighten the belt. Okay, why should the retirees and the workers somehow in some proportion both tighten the belt? In other words, why not make the Social Security benefits also responsive to macro fluctuations? Germany has it. I won't go into what is exactly this factor, the PV, but you see it doesn't have an index I, a T. Uh, sorry, an index I. The others all are for I. And this one is just T, just time. Okay, it's not for particular individuals. It depends on the macro situation at time t. 
dependency ratio, it doesn't matter what. But basically, Germany wanted to smooth that everybody will burden macroeconomic fluctuations. I just raised these issues, and then I just want finally to tell you about the adjustment. Sweden also has a way, when the system, you can ask, what guarantees that the system in Sweden will be in balance all the time with these 5% the government has determined? There may be a problem there too. So they have what they call a balance ratio. It's partially funded, where if the balance ratio goes below one or something, then they change the rate of interest, the, 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 the return. There are certain slides here that show that this adjustment that they do is suboptimal, is not really, uh, and, but that they will have to consider it again. But they have a break system. In other words, the recession of 2008 reduced the return that the government promised from 5% to 4%. And then there was acceleration back of 6% until they got back to the steady state. Do you understand? That's, so the system is not com completely uh, 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 is sensitive to macro fluctuations to some extent. So I wanted to summarize, I wanted to bring up the, the European system, the, the tier, the first tier, which is a universal tier flat, which is to avoid, which, whose ma main objective is to avoid poverty. The second tier <coughs> could be a notional defined contribution, which some countries have and more are considering now. In this country, we don't have it. Other countries have, but perhaps the time will come when we'll need uh, reform in the social security and these ideas will come before also here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Shashinsky. This is a great example of an individual tackling one of the greatest problems really of our day, fiscal problems that is, and thank you for your efforts and for being here at the center to discuss this important topic. We do have time for just a couple questions from the audience, and I think we have a roaming mic so if you'll raise your hand, if you've got a question, we'll bring a mic to you. No one else is going to ask a question, I will. Uh, you mentioned the indexation of social security benefits for retirees and the, debate be and the debate between indexing the benefits to wage growth versus the consumer price index. Uh, it's a well-known fact in macroeconomics that the inflation rate calculated by the percentage change in the CPI overestimates the true cost of living increase by at least one to two percentage points. So in reality, if benefits are indexed to the CPI, the benefits and purchasing power of retirees are actually growing um, through retirement. And so I just wanted you to comment and see if uh, in alleviating the fiscal pressures on the system, if a re-indexation to the CPI less one or two percentage points might be a feasible strategy. Yes, I'm... Uh familiar with this issue. I think in microeconomics two and second year, uh, you learn that, that indeed that uh, uh, indexing to prices uh, and the price price index, LSPR or PASH price index, I remember very well, and the Boskin Commission also looked into this issue, is overstating to some extent the, in welfare terms, what should be compensated. It's an overcompensation by how much could be debated. Depends on substitutability. I won't go into the fact that in the, into the, in the, in the issue. Um, but I think, and, and Sweden, by the way, Sweden therefore has decided to index to the wage growth minus 1.6%, 1.6. 6. 1.6 is considered the steady state wage growth, which is, uh, could be uh, in the long run. And I don't think it's a good system. I didn't have the time to go into that, but that's, that's not a very good system. But they have realized the fact that perhaps by indexing to wages, it's overstated. So you see the other countries decided on a mix of the two. It's arbitrary. Whatever you do, it's arbitrary because you don't know to what extent the CPI is overstating the price increase, okay, in terms of welfare, in welfare terms. So it will be arbitrary in one way or another. Uh, it depends on substitutability. People have to make restudies. You can do it. You cannot. It's not feasible to do it annually on an annual basis. So that's what I said. Finland decided 20% wage growth, 80% CPI. Switzerland 50-50. It's arbitrary. But I think more important is the ideological issue here. Wage indexing to wage wages means that you want to preserve the relative status of retirees relative to the workers. 
If you index to the CPI, it means the retirees should only be, uh, uh, should retain their purchasing power level. Workers rise and therefore the gap will increase between retirees and workers. It's an ideological issue, but also a political financial issue, and I have nothing to say more. I guess I get the last question. Um, so you mentioned lots of great ideas that other countries have implemented. Which one of those ideas, if implemented in the US, would have the greatest impact for improving our pension system? Well, it will be very difficult to reform the social security system given the impasse which I talked about at the beginning of my lecture today uh, in Washington. Um, I think, I think to be realistic, I don't think that the three tiers, as in Europe, will be in the foreseeable future be adopted here in this country. But I think Social Security should start taking into account, it can be reformed gradually with, I think, a bipartisan agreement on, for example, on the issue of the life expectancy divergence between, uh, the, uh, the, the, depending on the level of income the fact that the rich are living longer. Are all, uh, expected lifetime increases for all levels of income, but more so for the rich than for the poor. Perhaps we'll have to find some measures and methods can be found. This works, uh, of course, to reduce the progressivity and perhaps make the whole system regressive. Uh, the social security, something, all, all kind of measures can be done using specific mortality tables and others. I don't want to go into that, but this can be done. So gradual, slowly, I don't think that in this country there's a chance of moving into an NDC uh, and, and a first tier, a flat first tier, as so many other countries, both in Europe and in Latin America, have uh, is feasible uh, uh, today. Let's be realistic. Okay, let's give Professor Shishinsky one more big hand. Thank you.